Good evening, everybody. How is everybody doing? Uh, welcome to the final lecture uh, in our 2019 spring series. I hope you agree it's been a really great uh, and exciting series, and it's going to end on a high note tonight. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Uh, before we get to tonight's talk, I have to acknowledge all the folks that have helped put it together. I want to again thank the Norris Foundation, which helps provide support uh, for the series. We really are greatly, they've supported many years, which is really wonderful. Uh, we, of course, want to thank the Huntington for allowing us to use this amazing auditorium. Uh, and I also want to thank all the Carnegie and Huntington volunteers who really made the check-in process, I think, much easier than it's been in the past. So we really want to thank everybody for helping with that. <clears throat> now, I'll remind you, uh, if you are not on the Carnegie list, uh, many of you I know find us through the Huntington um, and want to sign up. There is still a way to sign up on the way out. You'll see an iPad where you can sign up. I would recommend you do that if you want to know about other events. Uh, particularly, we have a big open house we do in October. This year it will be on October 13th. We already have a date set, so I hope to see many of you there if you want to see our campus. Uh, and we'll also be celebrating some big anniversaries this year, uh, the 50-year anniversary of our Las Capanas Observatory in Chile, the 100-year anniversary of Edwin Hubble arriving here in Pasadena, and so we have, yeah, lots of excitement. Um, so we will be doing events uh, related to those in the fall, so please make sure you are signed up to learn about those events. Okay, <clears throat> now on to tonight's speaker. Uh, so Allison Strom uh, completed her PhD right down the street at Caltech uh, in 2017. Uh, and then she came to Carnegie as a, one of our prestigious uh, Carnegie Princeton Fellows. This is a fellowship which allows them to spend uh, three years here in Pasadena at Carnegie and then two years over at, Cal uh, at Princeton finishing um, their uh, uh, postdoc position. It's a really amazing fellowship. Um, Allison works on detailed studies of very distant galaxies. And I thought I would just put this in perspective uh, for you. In, in the mid-20s, when Carnegie astronomer Edwin Hubble measured the distance for the first time to the nearby Andromeda galaxy, he found that it was a million light years away. <clears throat> that is a pretty big number. And at the time, it was shocking. If you would read the newspapers from the time, there's all these headlines about how, um, how incredibly far away that galaxy is. Tonight, you're going to hear about Allison's work. She's studying galaxies that are 10 billion light years away. Um, it's truly remarkable. I often think, lately I've been thinking a lot since it's, we're in Edwin Hubble mood because it's his 100 year anniversary, what he would think if he could just arrive today and see the work that astronomers like Allison are doing. I mean, it truly is incredible. Uh, I can't, uh, 10 billion light years is, is really incredible. You're talking about looking at galaxies that existed 5 billion years before uh, the Earth existed. It's really quite incredible. Anyhow, so <laughs> I'll let Alice, I don't want to steal all her thunder. Uh, but you're going to be, I, I'm sure you'll be in, in, impressed with her work as I have been. So with that, why don't we uh, welcome uh, Alison Strom to the stage. Alison? Well, I want to join uh, John in thanking you all for being uh, here tonight. Uh, while I'm not from California, I've been here long enough to know that a little bit of rain and cold weather can do a lot to derail even the best laid plans, um, especially when I am not indeed announcing a new Samsung phone. Um, <laughs> Uh, in all seriousness, though, I, I feel very privileged to be here to tell you about some of my work and the work other astronomers um, uh, in the field are doing, uh, because, you know, John just quoted a, a couple of really big numbers, 10 billion light years, and this is something that when you're at your desk every day in the office, you can forget the scope, you can forget the scale of what you're talking about. But astronomy is a study of the history of the universe, and that's part of all of our origin story. It's part of my story, it's part of your story, and so I'm happy to be here to share some of that um, with you. Now, um, any good story has to have a beginning, and uh, the beginning here today is the question, what is a galaxy? And this may seem deceptively simple, but I'm sure that if you asked everyone in this audience to picture what they think of when I say the word galaxy, it would be a little different. Maybe it would look like some of these things sort of um, in this uh, zoom through animation of the Hubble Deep Field. Maybe it's the Milky Way, maybe it's Andromeda. Um, but there is only one place to begin when trying to answer this question, and that's indeed with the Milky Way. 
So by show of hands, how many of you have been lucky enough to be someplace where it's dark enough that you can see the Milky Way? This is phenomenal. I'm very happy about this. Um, usually when I ask this question in LA, a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but actually, a pro tip, usually or sometimes when it's cloudy down here, if you drive up to Mount Wilson because of the marine layer, it's actually clear and you have a better chance of seeing the Milky Way than any other time. So, anyway, um, people from time immemorial have done as you have done and looked up at the Milky Way. And I'm sure when you did so, you had questions. You maybe thought, well, what is this? Why does it look like this? Why are there dark patches and light patches? Why is it different than the rest of the sky? You might ask, well, how many stars are there? What, how old is it? How did it get there? And these are questions that civilizations have been trying to answer for a very long time. And in fact, one of the stories that I recently learned that I'd like to share with you today is the Cherokee story about the origin of um, the Milky Way. And so this is about um, the spirit dog um, who uh, stole cornmeal from the people who lived in the South. So there were people who lived in the South, they depended on grinding cornmeal for a lot of their sustenance, and they noticed night after night that some of the cornmeal would go missing. And they saw dog paw prints, sort of in the detritus. But they noticed they were too big to be an ordinary dog. And so one night, they hid, and they had drums, and they had uh, noisemakers. And when the spirit dog came to steal the cornmeal, they made as much noise as they could, and they scared him away. And as the spirit dog ran away with a mouthful of cornmeal towards the north, he dribbled some out, and that left behind the Milky Way. And indeed, the Cherokee word for Milky Way is the way the dog went. Um, you're probably more familiar with the Greco-Roman origin story of the Milky Way, and there are, as with the Cherokee uh, origin story, a few different versions, um, but all of them have uh, Zeus's mortal son Heracles suckling at the breast of his wife Hera, and at some point Hera gets startled, she thrusts the babe away from her, and some of the, her spilt milk ends up forming the Milky Way. And indeed, um, this is tightly entwined to the etymology of the word galaxy, which comes from the Greek word uh, for milk. Um, and so if you look up galaxy in the dictionary, you find this. It says, any of the very large groups of stars and associated matter that are found throughout the universe. Okay, this seems good. That seems to fit the Milky Way. There's a lot of stars, there's a lot of matter. But actually, this definition and this word applied only to the Milky Way for most of history. And it's only been in the last 100 years or so that we've applied it to things other than the Milky Way. And the reason for this is that up until the 1920s, there was substantial disagreement about whether or not the Milky Way was the entire universe. Um, and the crux of the story, the sort of solution to all of our problems in trying to address this particular uh, debate is the Andromeda Galaxy. So you can actually see the Andromeda Galaxy with your naked eye, although you have to be in a very dark place. And if you're like me, whose eyes are only sensitive, you know, rods and cones, I can only see it out of the corner of my eye. It feels a little bit like a fairy tale. Um, but truly, Almost 100 years ago, April 26, 1920, there was a debate between two rather famous astronomers of the day arguing about the size of the Milky Way. And the, the, the idea was, well, if you could prove that the Milky Way were so large and that these mysterious smudges couldn't be further away than the edge of the Milky Way, then everything in the universe must be contained within our own galaxy. Um, these two astronomers uh, disagreed about a lot, and really no one came away um, as the winner of this so-called great debate. The person who finally um, helped solve the dilemma is an astronomer who also worked at Carnegie um, that many of you may be familiar with his name. So this is Edwin Hubble. Um, Edwin Hubble was observing uh, Andromeda, and he relied on some work by a female astronomer at Harvard named Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Henrietta Swan Leavitt had uh, determined that you could tell the distance of variable stars uh, by how quickly their flux changed. 
And so when Hubble was observing Andromeda and he noticed a variable star near its center, he was able to determine that, the Milky, or that Andromeda was a million light years away. And that was much further away than anyone had speculated the Milky Way could be in size. And so this was definitive proof for the first time that these smudges that people had been arguing about back from the time of Kant, who originally referred to them as island universes, were actually something outside of the Milky Way, that there were galaxies outside of the galaxy. Um, and this has led to a really revolutionary um, a change in modern astronomy. And in fact, that moment in the 1920s was the birth of extragalactic astronomy. And as an extragalactic astronomer myself, I feel very indebted um, to Dr. Hubble. Um, but you can see that the kind of studies that we can do now um, looking at these external galaxies are quite exquisite. So we can now see, um, from an external perspective, the dust lanes in galaxies like Andromeda, which look a lot like our own. And, you know, the quote about trying to understand the forest for the trees, well, the same is true with the Milky Way. And so having this outside perspective is actually very useful for understanding the history of the Milky Way itself. Now, of course, thanks to things like the Hubble Space Telescope, named after Hubble, we know that there are billions and billions of galaxies, quite literally. Um, and it's quite chaotic. There's lots of different kinds of things. We have uh, sort of blue spiral things, you know, these giant yellow footballs. We have ones with little plumes coming off. And basically, every spot in this, this image is, is a different galaxy. And so this is pretty overwhelming, at least even as an astronomer, I look at this image and I think what the first people who you know, realized that there was this abundance of galaxies must have thought, which, if they were me, would have been, well, where do we even begin to understand what's going on? So I wanted to, you, to take you on a little bit of a thought experiment with me and try and um, show you how astronomy has tried to answer that question. So for now, we are going to pretend to be aliens. We are not humans anymore. We are aliens visiting Earth. We don't get to talk to people because we don't know their language, but we can observe them. And so one of the first things that you might do, one of the first things scientists try when they're trying to figure out a question is they try different classification schema. So with people, you might ask, well, can we divide them by hair color? Will that tell us anything about the nature of human beings? What about hair length? We see some long hair, we see some short hair, we see some no hair. Um, what about glasses or other accoutrements? So we have uh, eyeglasses, we have sunglasses. Um, and perhaps one of my favorite, because I think it is actually related to something um, about human development, is height. So what if we were to divide humans by height? Could we learn anything about the nature of humanity then? So, maybe the next thing you would do is take all of the small people and put them in a bin, and you would take all of the tall people and put them in a bin, and then maybe the people in between you would put into a different bin. You could do this any number of ways. Um, and then the next question then becomes, well, do small people stay small? Do big people stay big? Or are these different groups somehow related to one another in a way? So do these groups be turned into one another? Okay, so though you could connect the dots a few different ways. One you might think is, well, maybe mass has to do with fuel, and you start out really big, and as you go through life, you use up a lot of your mass, and then you end like this. Right? I think that might be plausible. Um, you laugh, but that is only because we have prior knowledge of what the right answer is. We don't have that with galaxies. <laughs> um, so, of course, as we know, it's actually more like this. Um, it's a winding path to adulthood. Um, and so the hypothesis for this chain then becomes, well, age is correlated with height. And so, um, if you have a smaller person, they must be younger than a larger person. But any successful model for how the world works needs to be able to be applied to data separate from the data that you use to develop it. And so I'm going to show you a different picture with uh, different people, and I want, we're going to apply this hypothesis. So this is me with another human when I was getting my PhD. 
Um, and again, maybe show of hands, who thinks that I am the older person here? <laughs> no, this is my lovely grandmother who has a number of years of, of uh, wisdom on me, but she just happens to be shorter than I am. And so what's going on here? So if we look at CDC's information about human height, the average for women goes something like this, where you know it increases pretty rapidly at young ages, keeps going, monotonically increasing, but then it kind of plateaus, which makes sense. We reach our adult height. Um, but individual people are going to follow different tracks. Some might be taller than average, some might be shorter than average. And, you know, this spread can wash out any signal that connects age to height at younger, um, at sort of at younger years. And so this means that our hypothesis is not wholly correct. We need some other kind of information, or we need an independent constraint on human age. And the same issues with these kinds of schema also happen with galaxies. So we could do the same thing. Um, the equivalent for galaxies might be something like size or color. So we have very blue things, we have very orange things, maybe shape. You know, we have these sort of oblong ones and sort of messy ones. Or maybe whether or not they have spiral arms and what their spiral arms look like. Is there a bar? Are they um, tightly wound? Um, and indeed, this was also um, something that people have tried for a long time, including uh, Mr. Edwin Hubble. So around the same time that he was doing his pioneering work on the distance of Andromeda, he was also looking at other extragalactic nebulae, um, and he ordered them according to mostly their, uh, their shape, something that we in astronomy called morphology. And this became known as early type galaxies, these ones that look kind of smooth and, and uh, oblong, and late type galaxies. And all I can imagine is that we typically think of more complex structures being something that arises over time. And so maybe the idea was is that something simple must be young or early, and something um, more complicated must come later. Um, but in his paper on this topic, um, he actually says, and I will quote because I think it should be emphasized, the nomenclature refers to the position in the sequence, and temporal connections are made at one's peril. The entire classification is purely empirical and without prejudice to theories of evolution. So even though he gave those names to the sequence, he didn't actually think that you should be interpreting it the way those names suggest that you should. Um, but it is true today um, that you still go to meetings about galaxies, and they refer to these as early-type galaxies, and these as late-type galaxies, even though we're pretty sure these are the young ones, and these are the old ones. <laughs> okay, so, a lot of our schema may be a little too simplistic, so how can we leverage information about galaxies to really figure out what's going on? And so I want to return briefly to my analogy about studying people. So this is me and my other grandmother. Um, and if you imagine that we are trying to study people the same way we're studying galaxies, what we want to know is about each of our pasts. We want to know about my past, we want to know about my grandmother's past, and we want to know how the two of us are related. But we would also like some way, potentially, of knowing how I am related to a person that I've never met and never been in a picture with, but I know is my great-grandmother, Thelma, uh, Thelma Pope Adams. And the way we might do this, well, fortunately my grandmother is very good at uh, finding information and keeping records, but if you don't have that, this is becoming an increasingly popular alternative, you swab your cheek, you send it off, you do a DNA test, right? 23 and me, or whatever the other ones are. Um, <laughs> and this is a great, uh, great thing, because we don't always have the luxury of interviewing our relatives or finding out on our own about our past. And the same is certainly true um, if you want to find your ancestors and connect them to descendants. But the same is true if you want to find ancestors of galaxies and connect them to their descendant galaxies. We can't interview galaxies. All we have are these pictures. We don't even get to see a galaxy evolving through time because the time scales are beyond that of a human. Instead, we have to rely on DNA testing them. And so here we come to the thesis of my talk, 
which is that astronomers use spectroscopy as a way of adding information to our study of galaxies to tell us about their past and how they relate to other galaxies in the population. So in the image I showed you, we were basically looking at this. We were seeing how the light was distributed sort of in the plane of the sky, um, in X and Y, if you were going to put um, axes on it. But there's a lot more information available because what we are seeing is light, um, and light comes in a variety of wavelengths, um, and that can hide information about the physics behind the image. And so what spectroscopy allows us to do is look at this third dimension where a lot of that physical information is hiding. And now this quote here I find really charming. I remember being in a summer program. I think it must have been my junior year of college. And I was typing away at my computer trying to meet a deadline. And my friend's advisor was just excitedly chattering to her. And she said, well, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a spectrum is worth uh, a thousand pictures. That's a million words. And I was like, that's, that's some good math. Um, and so we're going to spend most of the rest of the talk now talking about how we leverage the spectroscopic information to study galaxies past, to DNA type them. So, um, just a brief primer on spectroscopy. What you're interested in doing is taking any kind of light, we'll go just with this example of a prism, with white light incident, and because a, a glass prism or a prism made of any material has a different index of refraction, so light travels at a different speed in the prism than it does in vacuum, the different uh, wavelengths of light will um, bend at different angles, and the same thing happens um, at this surface. And so the prism disperses that white light into its constituent colors. And something I've already said the word, but just to you know, clarify what I mean by wavelength, is um, basically just the color of the light. So purple light has a short wavelength and a high energy. This is just a, a definition from physics. And red light has a long wavelength and a lower energy. And this works for light even beyond what we can see. And in fact, this kind of experiment is how we first learned about infrared emission. Um, an early scientist noticed that if he put a thermometer just past the red part of a, a rainbow that had been dispersed by a prism, it actually increased relative to a thermometer placed outside of the path, because what you were seeing was the infrared light dispersed onto the thermometer. And the same is true, um, oops, well, for ultraviolet. Okay. So, now we're going to see this in action. Now is the time to put on your glasses, and Nathan will help me pull out um, the materials for the demo. So, the glasses that we've given you are diffraction glasses. They are not 3D goggles, I'm really sorry. <laughs> this is not a Marvel movie. Um, but, um, what they do is they function exactly like a prism. So, you should be seeing a lot of rainbowish light right now. Um, and, then, perfect. What? Oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, great. All right. Okay. We got it? Okay, perfect, thanks. So the first thing that I'd like you to look at is, um, oh, can we hold off on the lights? Just one second. I want you to look up at actually at one of these lights, and you'll be able to see sort of just all of the colors of the rainbow, right? You should see a rainbow, and you should actually see one on one side and one sort of flipped on the other side, right? Okay, maybe something like this, yes? Okay, so the purple, short wavelength, high energy, red, long wavelength, low energy. Okay, so now we can lower the lights. So that's what happens when you look at something that is emitting thermal energy, which means that um, it just emits at every wavelength. And in fact, each of you is also emitting thermal energy, but we can't see it because it's in the infrared. So what I'm going to show you now is gas of a single element in a tube. That we've run, we're running a current through it, it's exciting the gas, and you're looking at emission from the gas. So tell me, well, don't tell me, because there's a lot of you that would be quite no noisy. Um, but 
maybe take a moment, and I will also take a moment, to consider what you see, right? So I'm seeing, um, let's see, a lot of red and orange, would you, would you agree? Okay, um, it should look something like this. If this is the lamp in the middle, then it should look something kind of like this, yeah? Okay, and again, just as a reminder, this is the direction that wavelength is going. So you're seeing the same spectrum, it's just mirrored because of the way the diffraction works. Um, and this element um, is actually something many of you are probably familiar with if you think back to uh, sort of creative signs that you see around places, maybe um, at dodgy restaurants. Um, <laughs> this is the emission spectrum of neon. And so this is actually, you know, all of that looping script, this orange light is becoming, because most of the emission is coming from these sort of discrete red and orange things. Now, the reason why this is different from the overhead light is that what we're seeing is electronic transitions. So the electrons in the, the neon atom get excited, and then they spontaneously sort of relax. And when they relax, they emit energy at a very specific wavelength because of quantum mechanics. And that's actually the origin of the word quantum mechanics, is everything is quantized, and you see these sort of very discrete uh, lines coming from elements. Okay, so now we're going to look and another one? All right, so what are we seeing here? So take a moment. It should look different, right? Okay, let's see, let me remind myself. Oh, yeah, oh, that's, okay. So to me, I'm seeing a really bright yellow line, but you can also see lines out to like the purple and the blue. A lot less orange and red light here to my eye. And this is the emission spectrum of helium. So it looks pretty different from neon, right? And that's because the atomic structure and the electronic structure of helium is very different from neon. OK, last one. This is going to be the most challenging. So if you're ready for the advanced course in spectroscopy, here we go. Um, this one is going to be a little harder. There's only a few lines. The easiest one to see is going to be a red line. And when I tested this out, it was actually pretty far to the side. Um, oh, no, I guess there's a teal line, too, and a blue line. OK, do you all see that, the red line? The red line in particular, I want you to keep in, in mind. Um, and the reason why is because this is the emission spectrum of hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe. And so we see it a lot of places that we look in the universe. OK. So. When we look at an emission tube, we see these you know, vertical lines because what we're seeing is an image of the central um, lamp dispersed. But as astronomers, we want to make a chart that we can take a measurement from. And so what you would do is sort of take a slice through that spectrum and plot how much light you're getting at each of those wavelengths. And that's sort of what I'm, I'm representing here with the white. So that's what you would see sort of in an astronomical study or analysis. OK, you can remove your glasses now. We are finished with the hands-on portion of the talk. Um, although if you are interested, um, I think we can probably find a way to... Ooh. Nathan, can you come help me, please? <laughs> um, to make these um, available after the talk. OK. All right. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you this is because I think it is much more apparent and easy to understand what I'm about to show on the next slide, which is that every element actually has its own unique um, emission signature that I liken to um, a sort of a piece of genetic code. So this is a hydrogen, the one we just looked at. So here's that red line that I asked you to remember, and then the blue and the... Um, or the sort of teal and the blue. This is helium, and then this is um, neon here. And so what we can do is we can look for this signature of all of these different elements out in the world, out in the universe, and then we know that those elements are present. And that's going to tell us about the history of um, that material. 
Now we don't have discharged tubes sitting around in galaxies. Um, or, I mean, maybe we do on some alien planet. <laughs> Um, but not ones we're going to see. But nature has thrown us a bone, and instead we have things that function a lot like light bulbs. But instead of having um, an electric current exciting the gas, what we have is a lot of really, really hot stars um, basically um, shining um, intensely on the gas around them and heating it up. And so you get this hot glowing gas just because it's around the hottest stars, which tend to be the youngest stars. And so what we're going to look for is the signature of this glowing gas in galaxies. And so this is a picture um, of a different part of Andromeda, sort of highlighting these little knots of glowing gas. Um, that you can see. And indeed, this um, image is a composite image made of sort of broadband filters, you know, three color images, just like um, you might make with um, Photoshop. But this is a filter for H alpha, which is that red line, hydrogen alpha. So this is telling you that we're looking at that glowing gas around these really hot stars. And indeed, you can look at those spectra, like the one that I showed you for hydrogen, in all of these different knots. So um, what people have done is looked at the pattern of emission of these lines as a function of where these knots are in the galaxy. So they wanted to know, are the ones closer to the center different than the ones further out? Do they have different chemical abundances? Do they have different amounts of those elements that we can see the lines for? So here's this um, red um, hydrogen line that you all saw here now in H2 regions or star-forming regions in Andromeda, so, you know, a couple million light years away. But there's also emission um, from oxygen. So we also see a lot of oxygen um, out in space. It actually is one of the most abundant elements um, other than hydrogen um, and helium. Um, and the, the reason... Um, so if this is telling you about... Um, how these parts of the galaxy are differing from one another. You know, the, the amount of hydrogen versus the amount of oxygen. Um, this is going to tell you about how, um, how old this part of the galaxy is, maybe how many of those stars are there, because the more stars there are, the more glowing gas you're going to get. Um, and so this is a lot of physical information that you wouldn't get from just looking at the image. And the desire for this kind of information is why spectrographs, things that disperse that light into its constituent colors, are such workhorse instruments at modern astronomical facilities. So these are four um, spectrographs, uh, optical spectrographs um, at Magellan, which is the facility that Carnegie runs um, down in Chile. Um, but I counted it up once, and 70% of the instruments down at Magellan are solely spectrographs or capable of spectroscopy. And that just goes to show you how important this kind of analysis is uh, to modern astronomers. Okay, but now to what I do. So you can look at nearby galaxies like Andromeda, and then you can also look at galaxies that are a little bit, or a lot, further away. Um, so, you know, what I have spent most of my career doing is taking spectra of galaxies that are basically at the edges of what technology allows us to do. But just as a reminder, um, the further away that you look at something, the further back in time you're looking. And this is because the speed of light basically forces you into sort of a time machine, like a time machine kind of situation. Because there's a finite speed, Something that's further away means that it's going to take longer for information from that galaxy to reach you. So you're seeing these galaxies further back in their history than you're seeing these galaxies. Okay, and the reason why I mention that is because I'm not only looking at galaxies that are 10 billion light years away, I'm seeing them as they were 10 billion years ago. So we're looking at galaxies at a very different time in their life than galaxies like the Milky Way. The Milky Way is like an adult. The galaxies I look at are more like teenagers or going through puberty. Um, they're also quite messy, so I feel like that analogy works. <laughs> um, okay, so this is actually going to be a little challenging. This is always the issue with this image, but I think it really drives the point home. Well, the galaxies I look, like, look at are the ones like the little dot in the riddle of that circle. Now, show of hands, how many people can see that dot? Okay, 
A few. <laughs> Certainly not as many as I see in the Milky Way. Um, but this just means that because these things are very, very far away, they're very, very hard to observe. And indeed, this is why astronomers like me are so excited about using facilities like Magellan. Because large telescopes like Magellan are what allow us to collect enough photons, collect enough light from these galaxies to spread it into all of those wavelengths and learn about the chemistry. Okay, there's one more additional complication. If this is the emission spectrum of hydrogen in a nearby galaxy, what happens when something's very far away? As you might know, things that are far away from us in the current universe are also moving very quickly away from us because of the expansion of the universe. This means that their emission is what we call redshifted. And just, you know, in a very simple way, it's kind of like um, the Doppler effect when you hear an ambulance, right? When the ambulance is coming towards you, it kind of gets high-pitched and screechy, and as it's moving away, it sort of mellows out a little bit. And that's because the waves are compressed when they're moving towards you, um, and, they, and then they're sort of dragged apart when they're moving away from you. And the same thing happens when galaxies are moving away from you. Their light gets dragged apart. And so the signature of hydrogen that you might see in a nearby galaxy gets stretched. And so it's not just that the lines get redder, but the space between them also gets larger. But the pattern, the ratio of spaces, stays the same. It's like if you get a, like an inky fingerprint on a balloon and you blow it up. The pattern of your fingerprint remains the same. It remains your fingerprint, but it's suddenly a lot larger. There's a lot larger space between each of the whorls. So if this is something sort of moderately far away, it can get even worse. And you can see things really stretch, basically to the point, eventually, where all of this information is no longer visible to your eyes because it's been redshifted out into the infrared. And what that means is that to study the kinds of galaxies that I look at that are so far away and moving away from us so quickly, you need infrared sensitive spectrographs. So not just the kinds of spectrographs I showed you before, but specialized spectrographs um, designed to look at these wavelengths that we cannot see with our own eyes. And these are things that have um, really only come into their own in the last decade or so. And so this is a very active area of research. Okay. So back to the galaxy that may or may not exist. Um, this is what the spectrum of that galaxy looks like with one of those infrared spectrographs. So this is a spectrum I took when I was a PhD student. Um, and you're going to see those hydrogen lines again. So here's the red one um, that I asked you to remember. But we're also seeing lines of oxygen. So as I said, there's a lot of oxygen out in space. Um, we're seeing nitrogen and we're seeing sulfur. And so this is telling us that all of these elements are present, um, and that's telling us that stars have basically been at work. So after the Big Bang, the universe was consisted mostly of hydrogen and helium, and stars are essentially required to convert all of that into the stuff that we are actually made of. Okay, so now we can look at a lot of galaxies this way. And now that you are also spectroscopy experts, you can see the hydrogen lines, you can see the oxygen lines, and nitrogen, and sulfur. And what I really like about this um, collage, or rogues gallery, is that you can see that the amount of light coming from these elements differs from galaxy to galaxy, right? So like up here, this oxygen doublet is a lot stronger than the hydrogen line. But, um, let's see. Down here, the hydrogen line is actually uh, taller than both of these oxygen lines. So this is telling me that the amount of oxygen relative to hydrogen is probably different um, in these galaxies. And the same is true if you look at the nitrogen and the sulfur line. So this is telling us about the different amounts of those elements, the different DNA in those galaxies resulting from the fact that they had different paths. Okay, so here's just a few more examples. You can see, again, sort of really different things um, that are teaching you about the DNA, the chemical history of these galaxies. Okay, so I said that this was an active field, and I, I really mean it. Um, prior to um, the work I did for my thesis, the samples of galaxies where we had, we even knew we had any kind of spectrum, even just one, even just that hydrogen line, um, in the distant universe, numbered maybe 100. By the end of my thesis, we had something like 700. So I think that's pretty good. Um, and I was just one person. There were other people working on, 
on similar surveys, and so we're really seeing an explosion in our ability to study galaxies at this time in the universe's history. Um, but what I'm really proud of is the, the number of galaxies where we see all of those emission lines like I just showed now number in the hundreds instead of just four. So um, what this means is that we're now really able to make statements about what's going on with galaxies at this time. Uh, prior to that, we, we could make inferences, we had to make assumptions, and you know what they say about assumptions? Um, and now we don't have to do that. Um, and I think that that's really remarkable. Okay, so now we're gonna get to a little bit of a, a science-y part, so bear with me. Um, this is a histogram <laughs> showing the distribution of the ratio of oxygen to hydrogen in my sample. Um, and really the only thing that you need to take away is that things down here tend to be younger, um, and things up here tend to be older, and the sun and the area around the sun is somewhere around here. So the galaxies that I'm looking at, reassuringly, as I said, we were seeing them in their past, are younger than the, the part of the galaxy um, around, around the sun today. Um, and basically the way this works is because not only does every element have its own special genetic code, but that genetic code tells you about where it came from, which is great because that's what DNA does and humans do. Um, and so if the hydrogen, there we go, um, is already present in galaxies because it was present after the Big Bang, when we see oxygen, it's coming from sort of massive stars. And so what this is telling you is that the more oxygen that you've seen, the more hydrogen has been converted due to those stars. So that just means you've had more stars, more time for those stars to do things. And that's why more oxygen generally corresponds to an older age um, in the kinds of galaxies that I look at. But we can also look at some of these other elements. Um, in particular, I like the ones with um, the light um, blue because they come from lower mass stars. Um, and due to stellar astrophysics, lower mass stars tend to be a little more conservative in how they use their fuel, and they hang around for longer. So that means that iron, for example, takes a lot longer to be produced than something like oxygen. So if you see iron in a galaxy, you know um, that it must have you know, been around for a while. So you can look at the ratio of some of these elements to tell you something else about galaxies. And so now we're looking at the distribution of oxygen, which is formed very quickly, um, to iron, which is formed relatively slowly. And what that means is when you see a lot of iron, not a lot of oxygen, that that galaxy must have grown very slowly because it took long enough for you to see a lot of iron. But at the, uh, conversely, at very, a lot of oxygen and not a lot of iron, you're seeing something that formed really quickly. Sort of it burned through all of its um, uh, material very quickly. Okay, so unlike the oxygen uh, distribution that I showed you before, this one's pretty skewed. I would say that the peak is definitely towards the right-hand side of the plot, which is telling us that galaxies at this time in the universe, this early time, were forming a lot more quickly than galaxies today, which tend to sort of be um, down here. But, um, there are some advantages to studying local galaxies, and this is also where studying sort of the DNA analogy comes in, because you can do the same kind of analysis um, for local galaxies, including um, the Milky Way. So this is just a cartoon from ESA showing sort of a schematic of what we think the Milky Way looks like from the outside, where the sun might be, and then what it looks like from the side. So you have the disk, you have this bulge, you have globular clusters sort of in a halo, um, a spherical halo, um, and the sun is kind of out to the side. But because the galaxies I study are so far away, we're basically only capable of like binning all of their light together. We have to look at everything. You saw how faint they were. But when we look at local galaxies, we can look at individual parts and we can ask, well, okay, well, what about the history of this individual part of the galaxy? And what we find is that the center of the Milky Way, the bulge, tends to have the same chemical pattern, the same chemical DNA as galaxies that I studied 10 billion years ago. And so this tells me that this part of the Milky Way probably formed in a similar circumstance 
perhaps at the same time as the kinds of galaxies that I'm studying sort of back in their past. So this is, for example, how you would connect my grandmother, Thelma, to me. But now we're connecting the Milky Way to its possible progenitors. Okay, so ideally, we would love to do this um, kind of analysis for very distant galaxies, but because they're so small, um, it's really out of reach of current facilities. And so this is why astronomers are so eager to build um, even larger telescopes than those we have access to now. So right now, the biggest telescopes in the world are anywhere between sort of six and a half to 10 meters. Um, but the next generation of proposed telescopes are much larger. So this um, is a video from the GMT consortium, which is um, proposing a, a telescope with a mirror that is essentially, well, it's, it's a, it's like a cloverleaf mirror, it's more than one mirror, but like the um, effective size is over 80 feet. So that's, that's a lot bigger um, than what we have available to us now. Um, and what this will allow us to do is not only look at things that are very faint, because now you can collect a lot of photons. And in fact, um, I think the quote, the, the comparison is that the GMT, the Giant Magellan Telescope, will have 100 times the collecting area of Hubble, so the one that takes all of the pretty pictures of galaxies. And so you'll be, it would be able to see a candle on the moon from where it's going to be in Chile. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> but not only that, that additional mirror size gives you the ability to look at much finer detail in things that are far away. And so it'll have 10 times the spatial resolution of Hubble. And that would mean that from Los Angeles, for example, you could resolve a dime in Las Vegas. And so this is, what, this is the kind of facility that's going to give us the ability to make detailed spectral maps of the kinds of galaxies that I showed you that we're studying right now. So we'll be able to learn even more about how these galaxies built themselves and even more about their past. And so as of right now, um, operations for GMT are scheduled to begin in 2025, and actually construction is, is currently underway down um, at Las Campanas. It's being built um, on a, a, a ridge very close to the Magellan telescopes. So the other thing that astronomers like me are very excited about is not just learning about galaxies at this time in the universe's history, today and out to 10 billion years ago, but we really want to push it as far as we can. We want to see the very first galaxies that formed in the universe. But this requires you to go to even longer wavelengths. So I talked about redshift. Well, eventually we're redshifted right out of the instruments that we already have, and we have to go someplace new. And that's what the James Webb Space Telescope is going to do for us. It's going to let us study the DNA of galaxies right at the beginning um, of you know, known time, basically. And it's had a few delays, but is currently scheduled to launch in 2021. And while I was sort of preparing for this talk, I found a really lovely video that James Webb put together to remind you that it's okay that there's been delays, and I hope that you too will enjoy it. <laughs> it really is a technological marvel. So I hope that convinced you. Um, so we've, we've basically reached the end of the story. And just, you know, as a reminder um, of what we've talked about, um, I've shown you how astronomers use spectroscopy to determine which elements are present in galaxies and how this chemical DNA tells us about individual galaxies' histories and allows us to tie them to other galaxies at the same time and at other times. And then finally, I've pointed out how the future facilities are going to push this frontier even further than we could have imagined, certainly 100 years ago when we didn't know other galaxies existed, but even 20 years ago when we thought that studying the kinds of things I do was impossible. So this is probably the most distant galaxy in the Hubble Deep Field. You can see it's really red because of the redshift. And it's things like this and things that are even more distant that facilities like James Webb are going to enable us to study. So the future is... I guess not bright, <laughs> but exciting. Um, so thank you so much. I would be happy to take questions.
mics we're going to put out to ask for questions. We ask you to come to the mic and ask the questions so people at home can hear it. Mm -hmm. Everybody else? Wait, give people a second to do that. Um, if you can't make it to a mic, maybe someone can bring one to you? Okay, perfect. Oh, sorry. Ready? Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, that was wonderful, and I love my astronomy swag. I'm going to take this <laughs> home with me. I heard a report recently that the universe is expanding f much quicker than we initially expected. Mm -hmm. Assuming then that is true, does that in any way impact your type of research where uh, an estimated age is part of the data? Ah, um, yeah, so it, the, the expansion history of the universe is actually critical um, because what I measure when I talk about distance and talk about age is actually a recessional velocity, and we convert that to distance and age because of our understanding of the expansion history of the universe. But um, if it's been expanding sort of in recent history, then the adjustments, it, it really depends on where we think the adjustments are happening, and I am not 100% caught up on, on those developments. They think our current universe is about 10% younger because oh, it's okay. moving faster. Than sure, was, sure, yeah. but that's sort of an integrated value. But yes, it does, it does matter, even for, even for what I'm doing. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, decide. Okay, thank you. Um, on his question, I'm interested in why it's expanding, but that's not my question. <laughs> my question. We are all interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, when you're studying the relationship of hydrogen and oxygen and iron in all of these different mm -hmm. galaxies, is there some question about harboring life? Ah. Um, so on the scales we're looking at, it would be very hard for us to see signatures of uh, sort of organic kind of material. I think a lot of signatures for life are more molecules, and we're definitely looking at very hot gas, hotter gas than like the Earth could survive in. Um, okay. So I think the, the, the part of astronomy where chemistry is going to tell us more about habitability is looking at exoplanet atmospheres, which is actually another one of the science drivers uh, for the giant telescopes, because it's been sort of out of reach of current facilities. Thank you. Broke the mic. Um, I really appreciated your analogy of the families and the children. It was very illustrative. And I have my child here, and she's nine. And I wanted you to describe what you were doing at nine and uh, how you got here today from being. Sure, nine. that's a great question, actually. Um, because I will say that I, when I was nine, where was I living? <laughs> I was a military brat, so this is how I think about my history. Is <laughs> where was I living? Um, so I've always been interested in math and science, um, and I remember. Actually, I think about that time I must have had a small telescope, um, and I I was just I I would devour Astronomy Magazine. I read a lot about black holes, which is funny because I don't work on anything related to black holes now. Um, but perhaps for me, the most transformative time was when I was in high school. I had the opportunity to job shadow an astronomer, and he took me observing. He took me to a telescope, which was really the life-changing moment for me. But what I would tell your daughter is that um, there's a lot of jobs out there that you might not know exist. And so I'm really glad that she's here seeing the kind of things that astronomers do, because it's hard to be what you can't see. Hi. Um, so I was very fascinated by the fact that that telescope is so big and can resolve so finely and that it's terrestrial based. Um, and I was just wondering how that relates to these the orbiting satellite 
uh, telescopes, does it make them obsolete because now it's so big, or they still have complementary roles to play? He's basically asking space versus ground as telescopes. Oh, um, yeah, so they're, they're very, um, they've always been complementary, and I, but I think the way in which they're going to complement each other moving forward um, is different than they have in the past. So Hubble was great because it got you above the atmosphere, which is very turbulent. You know, you look at the, the stars and they twinkle and that reduces image quality. Um, but a lot of the light that Hubble can see from space, we can also see from the ground. That's not true of everything Hubble sees, but a lot of what Hubble sees. Um, the space missions that we're putting up now are basically things that can are going to allow us access to light that we can't see from the ground because the atmosphere is opaque. And sort of on the other hand, the ground-based facilities we're building are huge, like, like really heroic sort of efforts that we just are not gonna be able to launch into space. And so we're basically leveraging the strengths of the ground where we can go and we can tinker and we can, we can continue adding to facilities and then really taking advantage of going to space, which is where we can see things like x-rays and, and the infrared. Um, and well, hopefully we will have another UV telescope. <laughs> um. All right, excellent. Uh, let's thank Allison again for her.